Father, we thank you for what our eyes have already seen. Lord, we've seen the kingdom of heaven on earth already in here this morning, God. From children to youth to what's been done behind the scenes to what's the, the different ministries, God, that, that, that you are a part of in this church, God. And so, Lord, we just thank you so much, God, for the word of God that's going to come forth this morning, God. And, Lord, may it release a spirit of expectation. May it release a spirit of can do. May it release a spirit of yes, we are to do. Come on, say that with me. Say, yes, I am to do the work of the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, let's look to your word today. Let's find that, God, and let's activate it in our lives, Lord. And everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, again, I, I'm, I'm not preaching a regular message today. I'm going to have scriptures for you here in a little bit. But there's three things about Journey to Church. If you ask most of our people here that they know and they dr we've drilled into their, your spirit, what is it? If somebody asks you to describe Journey to Church to me, what would you say? Everybody say real life purpose again. Real life purpose. And I want to tell you something. My wife and I have been able to go to, to a couple of conferences here lately and on church growth and, and things like that. And I've been to some of them in the past and hadn't been going lately because it just happened. But anyway, uh, but God really put it on my heart this year to get back because I, I, I'm feeling like a hypocrite as I talk to other church members sometimes and, and talk with other churches and other pastors. I'm like, let me tell you, church, something. You, you, you send your pastor twice a year to a conference whether he wants to go or not. And I'm very adamant about that. And I look back and I'm like, I ain't been nowhere in a few years. But anyway, I'm, I'm, but I'm busy, Lord. You know, I've got things to do. But uh, so, so kind of got convicted about what I'm telling others to do, I wasn't doing. So I, I began to pray and ask God where I want to go. And then a conference popped up. Uh, there were, of course, there was one in Hawaii I was really looking at. But uh, I had to pray about that. But uh, and the reason I had to pray because I was my flesh was going to go. But anyway, I uh, was looking at one over, over in the island, but then, and then one popped up in Birmingham. I'm like, well, Birmingham, Hawaii, yeah, I'll go to Birmingham. But uh, just a good steward right now in that resource. But I uh, got down there and, and was challenged and have just had a chance to go to a few different more. And, you know, one of my main things, I can remember preaching this message years ago called Leaders Have to Be Learners. Yeah. I can remember it vaguely, man. I mean, and I remember, to me, if you're going to be a leader, you've got to continue to learn. You've got to continue to evolve into what God's doing now. And if you look in the video, what, what was going on here several years ago, it was great. It was good. But it's not now. And we're not, we're not leading and we're not visioning in nothing like what we were 13 years ago when we first came here. Amen? Did you pay attention to the walls were a white color? <laughs> you know, it was totally, you know, you look back and you go, wow, really? You know? But it shows you your history. It shows you where you come from and where you're at. But my biggest challenge is not where I've come from, not where I'm at, but where we're going. Yeah. Amen? And so this morning I want to talk to you about real life purpose and you know, we've learned a lot of things from, from some of my favorite pastors that I, uh, I listen to a lot and, and got to see several of them over the last couple of months in person at these conferences and have really been just fired up and, and I love their heart to share. And a lot of times when you go to a much larger church conference and there's, you know, we've got 13,000 ministries, we, you know, yada, 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 and you're like, man, we, we're, we're not doing nothing, you know. But I don't ever have that feeling because I know what Journey Church is. I know who we are and where we're going and I'm just excited about our church as I was sitting in the church, it'll seat five, 6,000 people. But what I loved about the heart of these men that got up and shared, they didn't talk about all their success. They talked about their failures. They did. And, you know, to, to realize that someone on that caliber of success went through heartache, went through failure after failure after failure, but yet they just kept on plowing. They kept on going. They didn't believe the lie of the enemy. You're not going to make it. You can't do church like that. Nobody will come, you know. You, and then you do a service that nobody did. And it's just, I mean, these guys could have, tossed it up and said, we're done, we're just going to go. But man, they kept on and it, you know, it gives you that inspiration to just keep on keeping on. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know, one thing the Bible says, and before I get into the message this morning, you know, he says, run your race. Amen? But at the last point, thing Paul says, when I get to God, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You finished your race. There's a big difference between running a race and finishing a race. A lot of, now, that's why I didn't run in the 5K. Because if I would have ran, I wouldn't have finished. Because I know I, can, I don't have the endurance to do that type of physical running. I don't even, I, I don't even like to, I'll, I'll run to a buffet table. That's about as far as I'll run. But uh, anyway, <laughs> just, I just don't run. And I tell people, if you see me running, you better run too because something's after us. But anyway, uh, a lot of people I know, they take off running. But when, the, when it gets a little hard, when you get a little out of breath and the muscles begin to tighten up, 
You just quit. And that's the time you've got to press on, amen? Paul says, I press toward the mark of the high callings of Christ Jesus. Pressing means there's opposition sometimes, amen? And we've had our share of opposition here. It's been very minimum, but there's, how many know when you're dealing with people, you're dealing with people? Amen? And so today I want to talk about real life purpose, amen? And, and a lot of you know that, and you know the stuff behind it. Now, let me just, let me just share with you a, a little bit ahead of my message here. I'm going to get to, but I'm, I'm going to vision cast a little bit. We're going to be changing some things here in the process because there was a point in time. Now, now, there was three times I stuck my chest out like a big dog at this conference. <laughs> Dead gum right, son. We, we got it going on here at Journey Church. I'm at this huge church that's got influence literally all over the world in Birmingham. Most of you may know the church, what I'm talking about. And I'm talking to some, I'm not talking to the pastor, I'm not talking to the associate, but I'm talking to some of his key leaders that are outside. They're the ones that had the name badges on instead of the t-shirt on. And I said, so they said, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from a little town in Eva. He said, where's Eva at? I said, well, we're, we're, we're right above Coleman. He said, Coleman? He said, what's the name of your church? I said, Journey Church. We've heard of you guys. <laughs> yeah. That's us. Yeah. How many of y'all run? Uh, we run just under a thousand. <laughs> we do run under a thousand, about 800 under a thousand. <laughs> but we're running about a thousand. We're running a thousand. We've only caught 200, but we're still chasing the other 800. Yeah. See, it's perspective, people. It's perspective. So I've chest out, bowed up. And then the, at the next time, a completely different guy, this cat's from Texas, but he's part of this association. We're just jawboning back and forth. He said, what's the name of your church? Where are you from? We're right above Coleman, between Coleman and Decatur, Journey Church. He said, we've heard of that. <laughs> I'm like, baby, listen, we, they know us. <laughs> I don't know if it's good or bad, but they know us. So, man, I'm feeling all right. And then I, then I get in a session where it's mainly just pastors. And it's real full in there. And they're talking about, you know, church leadership and how to grow churches. And the guy's like, you know, we do what we call on-site. We'll, we won't tell the church we're coming to do an evaluation. No, we just show up. Wow. He says, man, I show up and I'll get at least, he said, I try to get a minimum of 10 people and say, what is the vision of this church? And he said, you know, most churches I walk into, they don't know the vision. Even if they have one, they can't quote it. Son, I'm bowed up. <laughs> Look here. Real life per Everybody here knows that. If you don't know that, raise your hand. I'm going to slap you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't make me look bad in front of my friends. I'm like, I'm nudging my wife. We're there. <laughs> we, we, our church, everybody knows what. what Y'all know it, don't you? Yeah. Just say it again and make me happy. One, two, three. Real life. See, we know that here. And I'm bowed up, man. I'm just tickled to death. And he said, if I do find people that know it, it he said, I'm, like, I'm, I'm in awe that 10 people know the vision and can say it. He said, that shows me that church has got it. I hit another level of swelled up. Of course, I can't hold my breath real long, so I'm hoping he looks quick, at me quick. And then he took a knife and just stabbed me and let all my air out. And it made me realize I haven't done enough here. We're on our way, but we've we, we got a lot of work to do. And he said, and I mean, I'm so proud of, that two people here know us, from, one from Texas, one from Birmingham. They know us. We're on the radar, and man, we're doing something that even some of these churches in here ain't doing. Everybody knows what they can say our mission statement, our vision purpose. Then he says, and that's great. He said, but then I asked one more question. And I'm like, all right, we, we're probably there. He says, I asked them, so you know your vision statement. Tell me, how do you measure when you've accomplished it? <laughs> Why didn't you just stop on the first question, dude? I was thinking, and I'm like, we don't have a tangible way to measure real life purpose here, but we're fixing to. Yeah. So we're going to be looking at some 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 tr growth tracks to put you guys through that will lay out real life purpose in your life. When you get to the end, you're going to know your real life purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So that's in the works. Uh, it'll take some time to develop and do, but that's coming. Now, we know the vision of the Journey Church. What is vision? Vision is what do we want to look like when people look and see us? When they look at Journey Church people, 
no matter whether we're in here, in here is okay, but I'm more worried about what happens out there. Come on now. See, real life purpose in here is easy because you're with a bunch of other real life purpose people. But are you living that real life purpose vision outside these walls that when people look at you, and if, you, if we all got tattoos about Journey Church on us where everybody know we was Journey Church, what would they see? Would they, would they be attracted to this church by watching your lifestyle? Would they be attracted to the kingdom of God by listening to what comes out of your mouth? Would they be attracted and want to get saved and serve the same God you're serving when they read your social media? See, real life purpose is not just something catchy. There's purpose behind it, amen? How are we representing the kingdom of God when people look into Journey Church? That's our vision. What do we, vision is what you see. So what does people see when they see Journey Church? In church, worshiping, doing things, and when they see Journey Church outside the church. And so you're, and you're, you're going to hear a whole lot about this in the future. So you might as well go ahead and learn this word too, culture. Everybody say culture with me. Let me give you the definition of culture. You may want to write this down. Culture is this right here. It is a shared belief and value of a group of people. It's what a group of people we share and we value. And that's what makes up our vision here at Journey Church of Real Life's Purpose. This is what we share with you. This is what we value for us, for God, and for you and your family. Amen? Amen? I got news for you. We are not a redneck church. We're not some church up here in Eve or Alabama, just a bunch of rednecks trying to love God. Let me tell you something. This is a house of excellence. This is a kingdom house of God. This is a real life purpose church of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen? 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 Now, yes, we like to cut up and have a good time, but you've got to understand something. We're not going to have the reputation of being a bunch of just old, dumb hillbillies that just get together and do some crazy stuff. Amen? You are the heirs of the kingdom of heaven, your royal priesthood, the blood of Jesus flows through you, the royalty of Jesus Christ's bloodline flows through you and I. Amen? Come on, somebody. Touch your neighbor and say, that's you. So culture, again, second definition I found on culture, people with shared beliefs and practices. Not only do they share these beliefs, they put them into operation, they practice them. But there's going to be a whole lot more on that because let me tell you something. What you value becomes your culture. Do you understand? What you value becomes the culture you are. You can change any culture as long as you can get them to believe the truth of Jesus Christ. You can go from, from depressed to, to, to joyful heart off of what you value that becomes the culture of your lifestyle. If you want a culture just being, well, I ain't never going to be nothing, ain't never going to go nowhere, ain't never done nothing, then you just keep that. But that ain't going to be, that's not real life purpose. Amen. Amen? Real life purpose is not stuck in our past. It's not even stuck in our now. Our real life purpose is going into the future. Amen? Hallelujah. So let's talk real life purpose. Amen? The first part of it is what? The first word is what? Real. Come on, say it with me. Say Real. real. And I love to say this when I'm counseling, I love to say it when I'm preaching, I love to talk, we're just talking with people when they're talking about they're struggling. I said, man, let me tell you something. God can only deal with real. And until we get ready, or you and I get ready as a church and people and marriage or whatever you're going on, until you can get real and honest and just bear before God, God can't really deal like he wants to with you. But it's when, you, when, it's when you take off all the cloak and dagger stuff, you take the mask off, when you take off the excuses, when you get rid of, of it's his fault, it's her fault, it's their fault, it, when you get quit the whining and the complaining and you get real with yourself, now God can do the supernatural in your life. Amen? So the first part of our, our statement is real. Why do I preach in jeans and shirts and most of the time I got a coat on today, I didn't wear a coat because it's hot up here. We added lots. <laughs> and so, because uh, this is really who I am. Now, I can wear a suit and a tie. Sometimes I preach it at different churches, and I'll suit up, and, you know, and I can do that. I'm fine. But this is really who I am. Amen? I mean, I, I don't know how to preach any other way. I, could, I can bark preach, you know, if I want to, but that's not really who I am. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can say theological words. I can, I can say very large words, but it's not really who I am. I mean, okay, check this out. Mayonnaise. <laughs> mayonnaise. I can say it in two different languages. Mayonnaise and mayonnaise. That's a long word, guys. I can't spell it, but I know it's got a lot of words in it. <laughs> Amen. A lot of letters. Amen. So everybody just say real. real. 
See, the world has seen too many fake Christians. Too many people who want to be Jesus on Sunday, <laughs> but live like the devil Monday through Saturday. And how, how, well, how do you know that? You watch what they do, you watch what they watch, you watch what they hear, and you watch what they say, and you see what they post. The Bible says sweet water and bitter water cannot come out of the same mouth. Amen? Righteousness and unrighteousness has no place together. And the world is, the, the world is desperately seeking, now listen to what I'm saying here, authentic Christians. The world is desperately wanting to see what an authentic Christian does, looks like, and talks like, and the most important in the world, and we'll get to this in a minute, in, in, the, in the regular day of life, they want to see how a Christian acts in life. When bad stuff happens or when good stuff happens. When, when you're in the wine press or when you're dancing on the tulips, hallelujah. They want, they're looking for real Christians that live in the same world they do. Most Christians like to act like we live in a different world. Now, we're from a different world. I'll show you that in a minute. But we live in the same world. Amen? How do we respond when somebody wants to go into the bathroom and don't know what thing they are? Amen? Come on. Oh, he went there. So, anyway, real. God can only deal with real. How real are you this morning? Well, I'm real messed up. Well, okay, that's good. <laughs> Most of us have been and are go through some things. That's, that's, that's real. But there's a real way to act. There's a real way to, to, to handle it. There's a real way that God says anything can happen in your life that you really want. And it's real. Amen? I want to read to you real quickly. First of all, before I read Hebrews, I want to tell you something. <laughs> and I know we know it. The Word of God is real. This is real. Anything that don't line up with this is not real. This is, not only is it real, it's real truth. See, the most popular thing in our culture today is there is no truth anymore. What's going on in America now is if they want to get rid of real truth and say anything's possible. We, we're going to tolerate everything now. There is no sin. There is no wrongdoing. If someone thinks it's right, it's right, except for if you're a Christian. Now, you Christians need to be put down, shut up, and done away with. If you don't think that's going on, I don't know where you had your head stuck. It ain't in sand, but it's somewhere else. But anyway. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. <laughs> Boy, that got real real quick, didn't it? <laughs> For the word of God... Is what? Alive. It's what? Alive. It's not dead. Alive. Now we know the movie that's out that's made that sort of saying popular again, God's not dead. Yeah. Amen? God's, if God's not dead, then this word is not dead either. Because the Bible declares that God and his word are one. If God's alive, this is not a dead book. This is a living organism of the power of the holy words and through the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So this is relevant, it's alive, and it's well alive, amen? And it's all truth. Everybody say all truth. All truth. Everything in here is true. There's not a lie one ever been found in it because people's tried to disprove it. And I tell people all this time when I talk to atheists and I talk to, to, to other agnostic type people, I say, you know, if, if they could find one shred of evidence that this was false, nothing of it ever happened, if they could discredit the Bible, it would be all over CNN, MSNBC, C it would be all over new, every newscast. We've proven the word of God. This, you don't want to know why you'll never see that broadcast? Because it can't be done. It cannot be done. They have tried and tried and tried and tried. And every time they try to prove it and discredit it, they ain't got, they ain't got it. Why? Because it's absolute truth. Come on, somebody. Amen. For the word of God is alive. And I love the second part. It's powerful come on somebody say powerful power. this is the power of christianity not anything else the word of god the father the son and the holy ghost that's where the power to live a real life is going to occur it's not going to be from this over here or that over here or this feel good or this feel good or whatever you want to do this is the word of god that sets you free this is real and when you get this real and you real together you better look out jack you're in for some real blessings, amen? For the word of God is alive and powerful. Watch this. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, 
between joint and marrow. Now, here's what I want you to know. Look at this last part. It exposes our innermost, oh no, <laughs> thoughts and desires. Look at them go, uh-oh. The Word of God is so alive and so powerful, it knows what you're thinking and what you're desiring when you don't even have to say a word. Look at your neighbor and say, now that's getting real. See, the Bible's real. God is real. His engagement with you is real. His interaction with you is real. He is not fake. He is not phony. He doesn't say one thing and mean another thing. He, what he says, he does. And what he does, he says. And he can spot, <laughs> quicker than anybody, a fake Christian. Amen? Now, is that saying Christians don't have trouble sometimes? No, man, we all hit a wall sometimes. But when we hit a wall, we don't complain about the wall. We don't, we don't bow down and worship the wall. We don't do anything to the wall except step back and say, Jesus, we need to do something about this wall now. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. That wall will move and you can carry on. Amen? You don't panic about the wall. You don't cuss the wall out. You don't flip the wall off. Come on. You don't, you don't, you don't drink with the wall. You don't smoke dope with the wall. You don't lay up with the wall. You rebuke the wall if it's in the way of the, the, what the real truth of Jesus is, and you march on in truth. Amen? How many, how many need a dose of real in your life? I, I'm convinced today most people don't want to deal with real. Real puts them where they got to do something. Real puts it, I might be the problem. I don't want real. We want fantasy world. Ding, 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 hello. We want, we want to operate in a fantasy world. We want to operate in a blame world. We want to op operate in it's got to be somebody else's fault. Can't be my fault. God can't be real or I'd be here. <laughs> I'd already be doing this. My marriage would be like this if God was really real. No, where we're at, is a it's not a choice of God. It's our choice. But you can choose to get real with where you're at. See, the enemy will tell you, you don't need to get delivered. You don't need to go up for the altar prayer. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. You're fine. <laughs> Number one question when you ask somebody, hey, how you doing? Ah, I'm doing pretty good. All right. I'm all right. And most people are lying right out of their teeth. Just get on their social media and read a few minutes, and you'll know they're not all right. Listen to them when they're talking to somebody. You'll know they're not all right. Follow them on Sunday and see where they go, and you know they're not all right. Last Saturday, we was going to the Mary, Cody, and Stephanie. And did, they, did they get back from their honeymoon? They're already back. Hey, good to have you guys with us. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. now, amen. And my wife had already went to help set up, and so I had my three daughters and, and with me. I had Kayla. Let's see. I had two, three, and four with me. <laughs> and we were in the truck now, and, and we, we was riding on Nashford Road right by the Hartsville ball fields. And it was tournament launch day out there and stuff. Now, anybody knows me knows that, please don't take this one. I am a big, I love sports. And I think kids ought to be involved in sports, amen? It gives them discipline sometimes if they're in the right atmosphere and stuff. And so I'm not against sports. I'm not against, my kids have played sports. My kids still, some of my kids still play sports, amen? Not against it. But when I went by there, I, I, I had an epiphany. There's a big word. <laughs> I really don't know what it means. I just heard somebody say it in Birmingham. But anyway, it sounds good. <laughs> I had an epiphany here, and I asked my kids, I said, I said girls, what do y'all see out there? And they looked at me like, Dad, Dad you, you okay? Dad, that's a ball game. That's ball games. That's softball. I said, no, babies, that ain't. They go, what do you mean it ain't? I said, that is the largest church in Hartzell right now. That's the largest worship in Hartzell going on right now. And they kind of looked at me like, because people, now watch this, people were parked on the side of the roads. The parking lot was capacity they were on the side of the road they were up nearly to 31 at the civic center and all of them were, they were walking hundreds of yards to get to us and I said I said here's the thing about it girls I said these people got up early and left early where they could get to this service and be there early and they just didn't get up those some clothes on. They had to pack their chair and that little pop-up tent and their cooler and their, their fans. And their, they had to get a lot of gear ready, get it up early where they could get there early to get the best seat. Because they were excited about getting there that day. And I said, they're going to sit out here in the hot sun for hours upon hours. 
And they're, they have spent all kind of money to get here. And when they get here, they're going to spend all kind of money on hot dogs and hamburgers and, and little souvenirs and stuff. And they bought, t- they bought team T-shirts and hats and ribbons. And I said, and during the whole course of the day, they're going to go, whoa, yeah, that's it. You go. Holla, come on. That's what I'm talking about. They, they're going to be excited at times. They're going to jump up and shout. They're going to get up out of their chair. They're going to talk to other people that's there. They're going to engage. They're gonna, and they're going to be there all day in a hot sun. And if it goes into extra innings, they consider that exciting. Yeah. <laughs> They'll tell you how good that was. Oh, I'll tell you what, it's a game. Boy, we went into six overtimes. It was awesome. <laughs> but you let them try to set through church for two hours without getting up. You let them try to get, if you had to pack up a bunch of stuff and come do your own seating and your own tent here and serve your own self here with everything, two-thirds of the church would be at home this morning. If they knew that it was sitting out in the hot sun today all day, you wouldn't even bother going to church sometimes. If it was going to go after past 12 o'clock, well, we're just done. I can't believe that. Oh, my gosh. And you're going to take an offering? You're going to give 10%? You just spent 50% of your paycheck this weekend in the ball game. Now, again, please don't understand, I love ball, I love sports, but I'm not going to worship it. Are you seeing what I'm saying? There's a difference. And I know godly people who play ball, and thank God for godly people on ball teams. There are some, God, I love to see the ball team, the coach down there praying with them, man, that, that's a church, that's, that's a real church there. But they're, 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 what I love about them, they're at their church on God's day. Anyway, that's enough of that soapbox, hallelujah, amen. So we got to get real. What, what, are we really, what are we really chasing in life? What, are we, what really matters most to us? And then the second, so everybody say real. real. What's the second part? Life. Everybody say life. Life. <laughs> life. <laughs> Some of y'all said life. Others went life. <laughs> How many know life can be hard? Come on now. Life, life's difficult. Why is life difficult for Christians? Because we're still held captive by atmosphere on this planet. We live, we breathe, we eat in a fallen, sinful world. Not everybody's redeemed. Christ has not come back yet. Come on. But you and I are here with Christ in us. Amen? I know, watch this. How many know there's two sides to life? Life can either be good or it can be... Say it with me. Life can either be or it can be, yes. your life will be what you make it, want it to be. Absolutely. Now, in this course of life, has, how many had some good things happen to you? Man, some of y'all in bad shape. <laughs> I ain't never had nothing good happen in my life. Man, we're we going to have an altar call here in a minute. You need to get up here. <laughs> how many ever had a few bad things happen in your life? How many of you still breathing? Yes. All right, some of our paramedics need to go around. We've got some people dead here. <laughs> Good things have happened to you, good, bad things have happened to you, good things have happened to me, bad, but I'm still here. Yeah. I'm still breathing, and it's my choice to respond to how I want to to the good. It's also my choice to respond to life even in the bad. There's two sides to life. Let me give you a scripture that proves it. John chapter 10, verse 10. For the thief comes. Come on now, everybody say the thief. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, <laughs> and absolutely destroy. And he's very proficient at what he does. Although he's not real, really that good, he's just good at laying the temptation out there. We have to pick it up. Come on now. He can't steal, kill, and destroy anything from someone who's walking with God unless that person agrees with it. Amen? Now, that doesn't mean bad things are going to happen, but let me tell you something. When bad things happen, you can respond badly or you can respond greatly with God. Come on. So that's the first side of life. And most people... <laughs> Be honest with you, most people spend their life there. The old devil just killing, stealing, destroy everything I got. I try to get up, he smacks me down, I do this, he turns his way. My, my dog bit me when I come in, my wife's mad at me, you know. <laughs> How many's ever had that kind of day? How many's ever had that kind of week? How many's got that kind of life? <laughs> come on now. <laughs> uh, we got to get you to the other side. That's one side of life. where The, the enemy's just attacking him. And let me, let me give you some semi-bad news. He's not going to stop. He's never going to stop trying to get you to sin and fall away from God or keep you from getting to God in the first place. He's never going to stop. He's never going to stop lying. He don't know how to tell the truth. So what he says is a lie. Amen? 
But, but there's, here's the other side of the life. The I there is talking about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come. He has come already. That means you've got to believe he was real on earth umpteen years ago. He died. He's resurrected. He's, he's, he's alive now. He says, I have come that they may have what? Life. 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 Write this down about life. L-I-F-E. Living in freedom every day. Living, living in faith every day. The two F's you can change. Free, faith and freedom. Living in that when? How often? No matter what's going on. So you can live in faith and freedom every day if you're connected to the Lordship of Jesus Christ no matter what happens. No matter what bad phone call you get. No matter what bad news you occur. No matter what happens to your life or anybody you know. You have a choice to live in faith and freedom every day of your life. And it's available through the blood of Jesus Christ. Can I have a better amen right there? Amen. So he says, I have come that you may have life. But he don't want you just to have a life. He says, I want you to have that they may have it more abundantly. Yes. And then another scripture says, I can do exceedingly abundantly and beyond anything you can even think or imagine. And I've challenged God on this sometimes. I'm like, Lord, do you understand how big I can think and what my imagination can produce? <laughs> he says, yeah. And I already know it, but I like to, just, I like to, to talk to God sometimes, amen. With just, just get real with you. Lord, do you, do you understand the visions in my head that you gave me? He said, yeah. And I'm able to do so much more than that. Well, why ain't it happening, God? Well, maybe I got to grow. Maybe I got to get out of my past and my now where I can get to the future. See, if you're living life in your past and just your now, you'll never make it to your future if you don't know what it is. We'll get to purpose in a minute, amen? I've come to give you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. There's a word that's real popular among churches right now, and it's just like life. It has good meaning, and it, but it also can be bad. It's called the word, and I love the word relevant. Everybody say relevant. relevant. Isn't that a cool word? Say it with me again. Relevant. relevant. And, and our church, you know, we want to be a relevant church, but th there's, a, there's a hint of relevant that can be bad too, though. Because what's happening right now, we're, we're seeing people want to be so relevant to the American culture Culture is a group of beliefs and, and values people share. And we're seeing the culture of America be taken into the toilet right now, yes. literally. Yes. And so if I'm, I'm, I'm living this life and I want to be relevant, we want to be relevant. What do you want to be relevant to? Because if you want to be relevant to be cool to the world, then you're going to compromise and start acting like the world, even inside the four walls of a church. A church that wants to be relevant just where cool people will come in and stay in sin, I don't want no part of that. Are you listening to me? If, me, if, if being relevant means we stop pointing sin out like the Bible points it out, and we're not, we're not bringing condemnation on people, we want to set you free. Yes. If being relevant says sin is no longer available, ever, you can do what you want to, then I don't want to be a relevant church. But if relevant means we understand where people are struggling in life and we use the word of God not, not to try to preach it like, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and oh, this is going to go out on the radio, but I love people on the radio. I love your churches. I love all styles. But, but again, there needs to be churches with stained glass windows in them for people who are drawn to that. There need to be churches with pews in them for people who like the old stuff. There needs to be churches with, with nothing but an upright piano on there and, and sing. There needs to be churches with bluegrass gospel played in it. There needs to be churches where your suit and ties for the people who are, that's their, there needs to be churches where you don't wear a suit and tie, thank you, Jesus. But anyway, <laughs> I love all churches as long as they're not relevant to the world, they're relevant to God. Okay? We've got to be relevant to God, not the world. Amen? But... Our church's vision is, is, is to capture all ages, but you can tell by our worship here, we're, we're going after, you know, everybody, but we're going to use this method, and this draws younger people. How many you know sometimes when you go into a church, you go through a time warp? I mean, they surveyed young couples that had never went to church, and they, I think it was Bar George Barnard or somebody, a group or another, or, or Enjoy or somebody, surveyed a bunch of, of young people who, they found them, they'd never been in a church service. Now, we can't believe that, but there's tons of them out there like that now. And so they, they put them in a very traditional church with the steeple and, the, and, and, the, and, the, and they, they, they surveyed them and they sent them to different types of churches. And when younger couples who had never been in a church 
And again, I'm not throwing off on these churches because the, the body of Christ needs these churches because there are young couples that grew up in that kind of church and they need that kind of church. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. So th- please don't. But young couples that had never stepped foot in church, when they put them in a very traditional church setting, very traditional church building, they, they, the, the one comment they all made, it felt like we went into a time warp. They're like, we walked in and we had never seen pew. They'd never seen a pew before. And they're like, we sat on a big long bench with a back and arms on it. And then it's like, and, and people were dressed really fancy and had suits and every woman had a dress on and we felt out of place. And I'm not going to go into that, different styles of wear, whatever. <laughs> Just don't come naked, you're okay. <laughs> Please don't come naked. <laughs> if you do, we're going to cover you up in the name of Jesus. But, and they said, you know, and, and, and when, when the music started, it, it, this, this church they went to had a pipe organ. They're like, dude, we didn't even know what that was. And then they were singing. We were trying to follow along in this book, but we couldn't follow. They would be up here one tenant, and then they'd be over here, then they'd be back to here. Then, and then, and then the, the furnishings, the, and then we couldn't see out the windows. They had windows, but we couldn't see out of them. It had all this paint blotch on it. And th- they felt so out of place. Okay? Now, to them, that wasn't relevant. But the people who grew, grew up in that, it's very relevant, and they understand it. Now, our vision here is real life purpose to meet people in life of this century that want to find Jesus that don't want to go through a time warp. Amen? Now, again, please hear my heart. That's not knocking against us. We have to have every style of church that honors God. Because, again, people are going to pick based on their personalities, and you'll hear me preach against your personality soon, so don't worry about it. <laughs> they ain't figured out it ain't about them yet. Are you listening to me? They ain't figured out it's about them. They think they get to pick where they go to church. God says, I'm going to plant you as I desire. I can't get ahead of myself. That's in a few weeks. Okay? So, so we live life where we're at. And so we want to be relevant to what's going on in today's times. We want to be relevant to, to, to try to teach you how to act on social media. The church 20 years ago didn't have to teach people how to behave on social media. We do today. Come on now. We, we have to teach the dangers of going to the bathroom now today. We didn't have to do that even five years, even last year. But see, as the world changes, then the problem has the church has just stayed one way, one thing, and not kept relevant with the world to preach the truth that the real world needs to hear. They started changing like the world, or they didn't change at all. So part of real life here, our life part is, we're going to change and use any method that is relevant where people can understand it. But I promise you this, on the Word of God, we will not change the message of the Word of God because it is all powerful, all true, all the time. We're not going to get so cool that sin becomes okay here. Amen? Life. Amen? Life happens. But we're here as sons and daughters of the God to show the world outside these walls how to respond when life happens, good or bad. And they can say, that's what Jesus looks like. That's the God. That's the Christianity. I've been wondering if it really exists. They're playing ball and they're praying. Their team honors God. They're going to a movie and the movie honors God. I got to move real quickly. I know. Let me give you one more scripture on life. John chapter 17, verse 13 through 18. This is Jesus Christ himself praying to God the Father about his people and disciples because Jesus is fixed to come to the Father. But he said he's, he's prayed some stuff over them which attaches to us because we're a part of them. If we're a part of him, we're a part of them. Yeah. People say, well, that was the disciples. Let me give you the, de- the definition of a disciple. A disciple is a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. It didn't die when the last, when the last disciple died. Discipleship, disciples, we, I'm a disciple of Christ. You're a disciple. Anybody, anybody raise your hand if you believe in Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior. You are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this prayer was for them and us even today. Say, I have an amen. So I'm going to pick it up. Go back and read all of chapter 17. It'll, it'll, bless, it'll bless your heart. Praise God. Anyway. John chapter 17, verse 13 through 18 says this. Now, these are the words of Jesus praying here. He says, now I, Jesus, am coming to you, talking about the Heavenly Father. He says, I, Jesus, told told them many things while I was with them, them as the disciples and us, in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. Now, I could preach on that a month of Sundays. We are supposed to be filled with joy. 
The word filled there in the Greek means to be overflowed, not just filled up, overflowing. It means we're to get ours, let it pour out of us, and somebody else gets it. And he wants us filled with what? Then how come so many Christians look like somebody done licked all the red off a lollipop? How some, sometimes Christians get in a, the least little conflict and they yell, they scream, they rant, they cuss, they fuss. Why? I don't think that's the joy of the Lord that gives you strength. I think that's the, the plot of the enemy that takes away your joy. That you don't have to succumb to because of Jesus Christ if you get a real life. It's quiet now. We're here to show the world how to respond, amen? I've come, I've told many things that I want them, so why? So that my joy, they be filled with my joy. Ain't got time to unbox the rest of that, we've got to move. Verse 14, Jesus praying here, he says, I have given them your, I have given them your word. Say amen. amen. Now watch this, we're fixing to get real relevant to our time. We're fixing to get real relevant from an ancient writings of Jesus, because he knew about 2016, May 22nd, what's going on in America. I've given them your word, and the world hates them. What's happening to Christianity right now in America? We're being hated. We're, they're being taught to hate us, even though they don't know us. It's a strategy of the enemy. I've given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. The Bible says we're in the world, but we're not to be of the world once we get of the world of the kingdom of heaven on earth. See, I'm not part of the, I'm in this world, but I'm part of the kingdom of heaven even while I'm on earth. Hence the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come, your will, his will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. So then people say, well, heaven can't come to earth till Jesus comes back. Not according to the disciples' prayer. Some of y'all look at me funny. It's not according to the disciples' prayer right there. Honey, he flipped it. He don't know it's the Lord's prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. Why is it not the Lord's prayer? Because it says, forgive us of our transgressions as we forgive those who transgress against us. Jesus Christ did not have no transgressions. He said, I'm going to teach you how to pray. This is for your prayer. You're going to sin, and you're going to need forgiveness from them, and I'm the forgiver. That won't cost you nothing extra. I do not belong to the world. He was in the world, but he was from his father. How many believe that? How many believe that, that, that God looked at his son and said, I'm sending you from heaven to earth, and I've got an assignment. I've got, it's going to be real. You're going to do the life I tell you to do, and it's for a purpose. How many believe God looked at his son and sent him like that? Come on, raise, I want everybody to pay attention and raise your hand if you believe God did send Jesus Christ to do his work in the earth. Raise your hand if you believe that. Yes. Hallelujah. That's very important for where we're going. You're supposed to have his joy. Know this, he's given you the word. If you stay in the word, you're going to be normal. And if you're a normal Christian, the normal world's going to hate you because you're weird. I ain't got time to go into that. Get the CD. Now watch this. I love what Jesus says here. Okay, well, if he knows this, Jesus is going to say, just, just get him out of the way, God, and, and, and keep. Now watch this. Look, look at verse 15. Jesus praying here. He says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Now watch this. I love this. Verse 16. They do not. We, me and you, we do not belong to this world any more than Jesus does. That order. <laughs> three of you got it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank y'all for coming today. Now watch this. He's still praying to the Father. Verse 17. Make them holy by what? <laughs> by your truth, real, absolute truth. And, now watch this, make them holy by your truth. What else? Teach them your, which is? Truth. It's real, guys. This, every bit of this is real. Amen? Amen? Now, I would love to stop there, but I can't. I got one more verse. Don't put it up yet. We all believe and confess that God sent Jesus Christ, and we have faith, and we love God for doing that, don't we? Thank you, Lord, for sending. Everybody say that. Say, thank you, God, for sending your son Jesus to be real and to live his life like he did. Thank God for that. Check this out. Put up the next verse. <laughs> Just as you sent me, he's talking to the Father, into the world, I'm sending them into the world. Hallelujah. 
just as the Father said, I want you, Jesus, to go into the world. I want it to be real. You're going to live their life. You're going to feel pain. You're going to walk through it. But you're going to respond from heaven, not from hell. You're not going to give in to sin. You're going to overcome sin with the world. You're going to resurrect from the third. I'm sending you into the world to do all that. And now Jesus is saying, I'm sending my disciples into this world to do what I did. To be in this world, to be real, to live a life that's falling apart sometimes. If temptations come at you, bad things happen, your friends die, people get sick. Same thing around Jesus. He, when Jesus healed everybody, that you ain't read your Bible. Jesus didn't heal everybody he met. In his own hometown, he couldn't because of their unbelief. Jesus walked up to Lazarus' grave site, and it was multiple graves in there. That's why he specifically called Lazarus come forth, because if he had walked up to that grave and said, come forth, everybody would have got up and came out. He ain't going to raise everybody from the dead, but he's going to let everybody live in glory if it wants to. Amen? Amen. So just, he, now remember, he's praying here. So he's saying, Father, just like you sent me into the world, I'm going to send every disciple that calls me their Lord. I'm sending them into the same world. Don't take them out of it. Give them a protection and let them change the world. Come on, guys. Amen. See, when you think your life is about you, you'll never be able to live the life God has for you. The very first thing about life you need to understand, it ain't about you. It's about what you can do for the God Almighty while you're here and bring his kingdom from heaven to earth in people's lives. That's our, oh, come on somebody, amen? amen. <laughs> our life is to go into this world, this world. Go into it, amen? But no, go in, that you're going into it, you're sent into it. See, if you think you're just going to go into it on your own, no. I'm not, go, I didn't go into ministry, I was sent into ministry. I heard a, heard a story this, this, this past week of a, of, a, of a Calvinist that had the belief that, that God cannot speak to the people today. Most Calvinists believe that, of the, of the Calvinist faith. They believe in God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but they don't believe that, that, that a person can hear the voice of God today, that we have the scriptures and that's it. And he was riding next to an airplane with a very pre prestigious man of God, and this guy was a pastor too. He pastored the church for many years, and he recognized this man as a, and I'm not going to call his name because some of you may know him, but he's very, very well known in a certain denomination. And uh, he said, they, after they took off, the guy looked over and said, you think you can hear God, don't you? He says, I don't think I know I can. You can't prove you can hear God. He said, I can prove that God still speaks in just a few seconds. The guy said, well, prove it. He said, I take it you're a pastor. I guess you think God told you that. He said, no, I just assumed that. God didn't hear God say I did. But I, are you a pastor? He said, yes, I'm a pastor. He said, how long have you been pastoring? He'd been pastoring over 20 years. He said, who called you to ministry? <laughs> who called you to ministry? He said, the guy just turned and looked out the window then. Because if he acknowledged God called him to ministry, that means God speaks. Yes. If he admits God don't speak no more, then he put himself in the ministry and it's not going to avail anything. He's a heretic. Yes. Touch your neighbor and say it's real. Yes. Come on. Let's, let's take a five-second praise break right there. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Sit down. Hallelujah. Y'all in overtime, sit down. Y'all didn't, y'all didn't, y'all went in overtime when you prayed. That was, well, anyway, it's all right. We get excited in overtime here. So it's, it's real. And God can only deal with real. And you can only live the life God has for you if you want to please God. You can't live your own life. If I had my way about it, if I wanted to live life for me, you know where I'd be right now? I'd be in the Caribbean island. What time is it? It's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> now, I, I still, I, I, even if I wasn't saved, even if I was doing my own thing, I never want to fool with alcohol or drugs. It's just never even appealed to me. <laughs> oh, y'all hush. <laughs> was I squinting that bad? I gotta, I'm, gonna get a, I'm just going to get a Braille watch. That's real, ain't it? I'm just getting real. Get real. Okay, yeah, my eyes are fading a little bit. But anyway, if I was going to live my life the way I wanted to, to do what I wanted, I would be in a, on a Caribbean island right now. I would be on a dive boat, and I'd be, a, I'd be a dive instructor or a dive master on a boat. And I'd just come back, and then I'd get back, and I'd chill out on the beach all day long. And boy, that does appeal to me, I promise you. But see, I'm not here to do what I want to do. 
I'm not here to do what I want to do. I'm here to live the life that Christ died for me to live. I didn't choose to preach. He chose me. Come on now. So if he chooses you, he chose you to do something. Well, I have not. He didn't choose me to preach, but you're still preaching no matter where you go. You're still representing the kingdom of heaven on earth. All right, let's move real quickly. First one's what? Real. Second? Third? Oh, boy. Everybody say, oh, boy. See, that's the million-dollar question. What's my? Boy, do I hear that all the time. I just don't know what my purpose is. I just don't know. Well, first of all, your purpose is the will of the Father on heaven and on earth, just like in the disciples' prayer. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he wants. That's one of his purpose. Amen? It's the will of God that you obey him. Amen? But let me go, and, and, and really I should have used this story about the ball field we crossed <laughs> right here with this scripture, but anyway, just pretend like it's here. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, you're, you're, you're serving a purpose right now. Every, everybody, you're doing, you came here on purpose this morning. You're going to go somewhere after lunch probably on purpose. Well, I'm just going home Well, you're going there on purpose. You didn't just, <laughs> how'd we get here? You know where you're going. Tomorrow you'll get up and do something probably on purpose. I mean, he's going to work tomorrow. Now, you're going on purpose. You may not like it sometimes, but you're going to go because you like that paycheck. You like to eat. You like to have shelter, amen, and food and car to drive. So you're doing things on purpose whether you realize it or not. But are you doing the purposes of God in what you're doing while well, you're doing this other purpose stuff? See, where, what you treasure is where your heart's at, amen? amen. Now, I'm going to read it to you in a different translation just in a minute, but how many know the word treasure here is, it literally means a treasure. Treasure is something that's hidden. Arr. That's my best pirate, okay? But in the pirate days, what would they do with treasure? Arr, they'd bury it and hide it where nobody else could find it. But they'd make a map of how to get back because they wanted it. Come on now, amen? Amen? So treasure has to be sought after. Because they knew when they... <laughs> now, now treasure... Now, I'm, I'm speaking pirate. R is one word I know, and the other is booty. <laughs> treasure was also called booty. Because they knew if they could get to that treasure and that booty, that they could now have enough to fulfill their purpose in life. It would fund their purpose. So that treasure was really just a key to their purpose in life, what they wanted to do. Amen? Some of y'all got to get your booty out of hiding. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Some of you got to get your booty up out the sand and get you, shake your booty off and get your booty stepping. Because <laughs> the promises of God are waiting for you to fulfill them. Amen? All right, do this with me. And bring the Holy Ghost right back in here. We done chased him off. <laughs> the booty called me. Hallelujah. I said all kind of real deep things today. But what's this church going to go out here and post? Booty. <laughs> booty. <laughs> I thought you said we wasn't going to be a redneck church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Now let me read this same scripture. Matthew chapter 6 verse 21 out of the message Bible. It says, I love the first two words. It's obvious. Everybody say it's obvious. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be and you will end up being there. It's obvious to people what you value. It's obvious to everyone else what your purpose is. Your purpose is what you're putting your time, your money, your effort, and your energy into. That's what people see your purpose as. It may not be obvious to you, but to everyone around you, it's obvious if they spend time with you, what you, what they, they can tell you your purpose, what you do every day. It was obvious when we went by the ball field that that was a treasure for those people that day. And again, that's not sin unless you're worshiping it. As a matter of fact, I've seen people being led to Christ at the ball field. Hallelujah. Ain't nothing like a good godly coach. Many, a lot of coaches have led their students and their players to Christ. Again, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of sports, but not when it becomes God. But it, it was obvious that day that that was the largest church in town that day. 
That's where people wanted to be. That's what they wanted. They were purposed there, and so they spent their money, their time, their efforts, sat through the hot weather, sat all day, went into extra innings, and didn't complain about it. Because they treasure that. That's what they enjoyed doing. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But folks, let me tell you something. Your purpose in Christ is going to bring you the most fulfillment of anything in the world. I could be on a dive boat right now. I could be 80, 90 feet under the water loving it, seeing Shamu and all of his friends. Amen? But I'd still be empty, I know. It wouldn't be fulfilling for a lifetime. And that's the problem with people. We look for self-pleasure, self-fulfillment in burst of our life. And as soon as the new wears off on this, then we're off to something else. And when the new wears off on that, it, and I tell you what, the new don't last long at all nowadays. How many can even remember or honor 9-11 still? Well, we say these words, oh, we'll never forget. Oh, yes, we do. Because our enemy now has become someone we want to tolerate and bring into our borders. Oh, did he say that out loud? Yes, I did. Let me say it again. Our enemy has become someone we tolerate more than Christians, and we're trying to bring them inside our borders to kill us. I hear it said that out loud again, didn't I? And I meant it that time, too. That's just real. <laughs> See, there's that real stuff, parking, you know, real life. But when you know your purpose in Christ, do you know your purpose in Christ? Do you know where your treasure, is your treasure hidden, or do you have it out using it? Now, if you, if you don't know your purpose and you feel like the treasure's hidden from you, God left you a map to find your treasure. If you'll follow this map, you'll find the treasure to your purpose. And you'll live in that full of joy spirit. Even when things don't go right, you'll still be full of joy. Things go terribly wrong, you'll still, because nobody can steal your treasure. Come on, somebody, amen? It's yours. He gave it to you. Blood-bought treasure, amen? Amen? Real life purpose. Everybody say it with me. Real life purpose. Are you lacking in any of them? Are you lacking with being real about who you really are, where you're really at with God, where you're really at in your relationship, in your marriage, where you're really at with finances, where you're really at? What, what, one of the things that church members don't know, what do you really believe? Do you really believe that the Bible is absolute truth? Every bit of it? I'm so convinced I even believe the maps in the back of my Bible. I believe them, man. They're there. I know right where Israel's at, and Jordan, and Egypt, according to the maps of the Word of God. Because if you believe it, it's going to be valuable to it, and you're going to want your life to pattern after it. If you believe, see, it all starts with real. If you're not real, you'll never enjoy life, and you'll never know your purpose. But you get real, now you'll start seeing what life's all about. And when you're real, life, life is going to be more real. But let me just tell you one last thing kind of before we go here this morning. Real life purpose. In a few weeks, I'm going to introduce you to the steps we will know that if you've accomplished real life purpose. And if you haven't, these steps will put you to real life purpose. You'll know who you are. You'll know God. You'll know who you are. You'll know what you're for. And you know you can make a difference. That's basically our four steps we're going to put you through. Simple, isn't it? But how many people don't know it even in the church? I'm talking, I know pastors that don't even know it. They love God. But they don't have a process to get people to, to, to love God other than preach at them, shout at them, tell them they're going to hell. Okay, once you get saved, now what? Now you've got to live a real life purpose. And there's four steps we're going to take to get every person here that wants it to go through it. Now let me tell you something. Raise your hand if you're in leadership. Raise your hand. You're going through it no matter what you want. You're going to go through it. And if you don't want to go through it, you're not going to lead here. I love you. Well, I love God more. Real life, everybody say now purpose. Here's what I tell people all the time. Some people are real, and they're living life the best they can, and like everybody else, they're enjoying the roller coaster. <laughs> but that purpose part they struggle with. How many struggle with purpose? Be honest. I'm going to raise my hand too, because sometimes I do too. I still struggle with that sometimes. But let me tell you, listen, I'll make you this promise. When you discover your godly kingdom purpose in your life, that is the moment you'll begin to have a real life. Until you know your purpose, you can't have the full real life God wants you to have. So the tale begins the end. Your purpose leads you to the real life God had you to lead. 
God had you predestined before he knew you in your mother's womb, the Bible says. He knows your, your end from your beginning. Amen? He knows your purpose. When you find it out, now he can start your real life with you like he wanted you to live. <laughs> Amen? How many want to live the real life God has for you? Amen? Amen? It's what the world is waiting to see. This world desperately needs to see purpose Christians. Amen? Amen? Well, how do we do that? How do I know my purpose? And I mean, I make my last statement here. You will never have a purpose from God that doesn't involve serving. I've never seen anybody in the, in the Bible that when God began to purpose them, that they didn't have to serve. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Paul, Saul, Bartholomew, Matthew, Luke, John, James, uh, Hezekiah, Ezekiel. And there was a few people who were, were not so good, but they still had a purpose too. Nebuchadnezzar, Pontius Pilate, Judas Iscariot. They still had a purpose. But I can promise you, after the blood of Jesus has been shed, the purpose of the kingdom of heaven is for his joy to fill you, his realness to fill you, his life to fill you, and his purpose to fill you. You cannot have that without serving some, something greater than yourself. Do you think I could fulfill my role as a pastor if I didn't serve God in the church? Absolutely. That's what I'm, I mean. <laughs> if you figure that out, I'm going to be at the beach. I can still be a pastor. Absolutely, man, I'm there. But I won't be full of joy but maybe for a short season because I know what my purpose is and I find joy in my purpose. And let me just give you one more piece of advice before we go this morning. When you get your purpose in God, please don't complain about it. Say that with me. Don't complain about the purpose of God. Can I give you one nugget before we leave? I'm going to be preaching this soon too, but I'm going to go ahead and get a little, a little ahead of myself a few weeks. God led me here. God led me to this marriage. God led me to this church. God led me, has led me into ministry. And I preached on this a few weeks ago, God called. And remember I told you the callings of God are without repentance. If he calls you to it, you're going to stand accountable to it no matter if you like it or not. So be careful what you say God called you to. But I hear people, God called me, God led me, God told me. Anytime you invoke that name, you put his weight of heaven behind what you say on earth. Okay, because we, 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 we look at God, well, God called me here, God led me here, so if God called me and led me, it's going to be mighty and powerful and God, and people are going to just love what I do, and they're going to hold me high. Are you kidding me? You ever ministered? But, we, but, it, but if God calls you, surely it's got to be good. Seems like I remember all 11 disciples were martyred for Christ. God called his son to come to earth. How'd that turn out for him in the earthly realm? God called Jesus. <laughs> God, let me just, oh, I'll use the proper word, God. And after his baptism, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. So sometimes he may be leading you into some temptation, but he's not going to lead you into temptation that you can't overcome. And then the Bible says, in the last day when Jesus was in the garden praying, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but never my will, your will be done. And some translations say it like this, and the Spirit led him to Calvary. So see, God will lead you sometimes, but it ain't all roses and stuff. Like sometimes there's pain involved. Sometimes there's, you're being pressed on every side. He just wants to see if you're real. He wants to see if your life will reflect him in all times. And he wants to see if you'll stay on your purpose. Do you know how many Christians want to quit Christianity as soon as one bad thing happens? Oh, I'm going to preach. I'm going to pastor a church. And they pastor about two years. And when the honeymoon's over, somebody says something. They don't get their way. So vision didn't happen like they want to. Well, God's not real. I'm out of ministry and I'm never going back to church. I know pastors like that right now. Don't even go to church anymore. And I pray for them. I'm not mad at them. And I, want, I want to see them restored. Amen. I want to speak life into them, not death. But when you're purposed, there are trials and tribulations that come in purpose. But there's a God that will walk you through it if you'll get real, if you'll have his life, and you'll stay on his purpose. Amen. Amen. Don't give. 
Don't give. And don't give the stand our feet.